Good morning, everybody. It is great to see you here this day. We're gathering to worship the Lord here on April the 11th, 2021. We had a wonderful time last Sunday at the amphitheater as we met together with one service. Uh, just great. I want to thank everybody who worked to create that reality. That was a just a very, very special time of worshiping the Lord together. If you haven't already done it, I hope you have a copy of today's bulletin or you can get to it by the website. Also, I want to say good morning and welcome to our online friends. We love you. We're glad you're joining us via technology, and we're pleased to see those that are here in person. A lot of great things continue going on We're as um, things are changing. Uh, the governor has uh, res taken, uh, re backed off a little bit about the mask mandate in the state of Alabama. Uh, some of us are still wearing masks. Some of us aren't. It's fine for whatever you want to do. We're just glad you're here worshiping the Lord together. The Beckham Sunday School class meets today for the first time in several months. Uh, I mean, I'm just thrilled. Uh, the small groups are so important to Christian living, and they're meeting again. I talked to Tom on the phone a little while ago. I went to the room, stood in there, looked around, and prayed for the experience. I'm just excited. The Beckham class meets, and if you are an adult looking for a Sunday school class at our church, you can give that a try. That's the classroom right there as you go up the stairs in the hallway. Also, we're starting road dinners this week. Uh, our menu is grilled pork loin, roasted red potatoes, green beans, rolls, sweet tea and desserts. They are just really, really, that's a great meal. Uh, $5, you can you can't go to Whataburger for $5, so you need to come here instead, eat with your brothers and sisters in Christ, and just have a good, good time. There, there is a, a piece of paper in your bulletin. Uh, if you'd find that and fill it out and put it in the offering plate, I mean, or the offering box, or give it to Renee. Renee, raise your hand. So everybody knows this lady there in the back. Uh, she'll take it from you, and she's keeping the list. We have administrative council and finance committee meeting Monday night, that is tomorrow. And then we're having just a great time of ministry on Wednesday night with children, middle school and high school people coming together, serving the Lord together. And then on Friday, we're going to start back um, our kickball season. Uh, whether you like kickball or not, whether you know how to even the rules of kickball, you can come and play or just be around people. It's going to be a great week. Let's continue to serve the Lord together. If you would like, if you've set aside your 40 things for the 40 days of Lent and you would like to go ahead and get them out of your house, lest you be tempted to try to not give them away, you can bring them to the church. Many people already have, and we'd love to have you do that. Now let's turn our attention to the Lord. Let's worship the Lord with joy today. God bless you. Let's stand as we sing, your love awakens me.
Again, let me say uh, how pleased I am to see every one of you here in person. And during the Sunday School Hour, I'll get on Facebook and see who joins us uh, via Facebook Live. Uh, please say hi if you're on Facebook Live. So we sometimes, uh, I've had people tell me, and I, I really appreciate it, man, you know, I, I like your preaching, Dave. You're a good preacher. And I'm like, how do you know that? I've never seen you before. And they say, because I'm there every Sunday on Facebook. And I go, praise the Lord. But I don't know that. So say hi on Facebook. Give me a hi right now. Uh, I got to tell you, it's just great to be here. Um, <laughs> did anybody notice? Well, this happens so often, it's probably not very noticeable. But did anybody notice I said something really goofy last Sunday morning? <laughs> some of you are, remember that. I said, I'm so happy to see some of you. What I meant to say was I'm happy to see all of y'all, but there's some of you I haven't seen in months and even a year, and I'm really excited to see you. But uh, it came out like I didn't like some of the people there. And uh, I want to dispel all rumors of that, that I, I, I love every one of you. And uh, I'm not saying that like, you know, the rock stars say that to the hyped up audience. I genuinely love every one of you here in worship person. Those of you online, I love every one of you, and I, I just appreciate you, and I consider it a, a grand privilege that we get to be in this thing together called the family of God. You know, I realize I sometimes think about my week. I'd like to maybe, maybe start with uh, Sean over there and work our way all the room, way across the room to Greg and schedule one hour a week with every one of you, and we could talk a little bit and know how each other's doing and pray for each other at the end. That'd be so good. Uh, of course... My sermon next week would be pretty lousy because uh, there's other work I need to do. But I would love to do that, but time is uh, a limiting factor. So, But I just want to tell you that I love you and I appreciate you very, very much. Uh, as we go to prayer, I want to ask that you pray for Derry England. He's the gentleman that always sits over there on the front row to my left, to your right, every Sunday morning. Today's his birthday, and he's really sick. Uh, you know, you can talk to somebody on the phone and tell they're down. You know that sound? of the. I talked to him last night, and he was really down. And then I called him this morning and noticed he pulled, put his phone off the hook. Uh, so I'm going to try to stop by and see him in a little while. But let's pray for Derry. He uh, got out of the hospital Monday and looked like he may be heading back. And if, if you've ever gotten out of the hospital and had that bounce back experience, it's depressing. So let's pray for Derry. And also continue to pray for Barbara Trout. Talk to Jim this week, and they're really continuing to have some struggles uh, with it, her, even though uh, Barbara is out of the hospital. Uh, we want to pray for the family of Betty McLean. She passed away. Her service was yesterday. Many of us have very fond memories of her as a very positive, loving, and encouraging person. Uh, and another person we need to pray for related to Betty McLean is Betty Butler. No, I've got a lot of Bettys here. I don't want you to get them confused. But Betty Butler, Betty McLean, and Edwina Black became friends when they were six years old. And they were always friends their whole life. And now Betty is the only one left of that group. And she was really, seemed to be in good spirits at the viewing and the funeral yesterday. But I, I know this is bothering Betty, and we love her, and we want to pray for her. Also, uh, another Betty... Betty McLarty, who lives here in Chickasaw, uh, spent some time with her this week. They, uh, she seems to be, uh, for lack of a better word, digressing health-wise, and we want to pray for her and her family as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the power of the resurrection. We thank you for the joy that is ours through you. Uh, Lord, help us to all understand how extravagantly we are loved, that we're loved and we're loved extravagantly. Help us to boldly take hold of every blessing you give to us, that we may grow in your love and grace and be filled with every spiritual fullness you have for us. Lord, teach us from your word that we may grow in love and grace, that your power may abound more and more in our lives. Lord, help us to hear this challenging word from the parable of the unmerciful servant, help us to understand 
more than a transaction trading with God way, but really what you're saying to us about our state when we receive your gift of forgiveness. What a big deal that is. Lord, we do pray for our brothers and sisters that are not with us today. Some are facing medical challenges. Some are just out of town. Lord, bless each family richly. But we really want to pray for Derry England, who looks like he may be having to go back to the hospital again. Lord, help him be able to make wise choices, move forward with his health and other affairs in his life, that you may give him everything you have for him. And we pray the same for Barbara and Jim Trout as they continue to struggle with some ongoing medical challenges, that they will be able to be free from uh, these terrible problems and that you can just give them some blessed time together. Many tests were run in the last two weeks with Barbara helping be able to discover exactly what's causing that and bring her into wholeness and health again. We pray for the family of Betty McLean, and we just ask that you bless them and bring them your strength and comfort. We thank you for a good experience with the service yesterday. And Lord, we just ask you especially be with Betty Butler. She has now lost the second of the group of three that she's belonged to since she was six years old. Give her the grace that she needs. And Lord, we do lift up Betty McClarty and her two daughters and grandchildren, great-grandchildren that uh, looks like transitions are happening in that family. And Lord, just bless them and help them with these days ahead. Gracious Lord, help us as a church to stay in step with you and to move forward doing kingdom work here in Chickasaw and even kingdom work that affects places very far away from here. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As you, uh, we prepare for our offering, I want to let you know, uh, I sent out a letter this week to everybody in the church family about uh, roof work we had done this week. It was amazing. They did it all in one day on Wednesday, brought a big crew in and worked very, very, very hard. Uh, they, it, it is uh, the, the part of the building that is behind me that runs perpendicular here to the sanctuary section running all the way from the end out there by the Rose Garden to where the new section was built on a number of years ago, which we call the Educational Wing. And I got to tell you, I was really, I'm always excited when a church buys a new roof. And I'm always excited when a church that I'm a part of buys a new air conditioner. You say, boy, you are really bored, Dave. <laughs> no. Being able to buy roofs and air conditioners is a sign of health for a church. And when churches close, a lot of times what causes them to close is a roof or an air conditioner. And they realize they no longer have the money to take care of this sudden expensive need. And we were able to do this. We were short uh, uh, three, a little over $3,700. And I asked you in the letter, would you give a gift sometime in the next month? In addition to your regular tithing, pray to do this. Any amount will be appreciated. If we spread this amount over our whole church family, it won't be too much of a burden for any one of us, and we'll take care of paying off this need. Uh, what we did was we borrowed the money from ourselves, and we need, need to be able to pay it back. Uh, it's really uh, exciting. They did a great job. Uh, I'm not going to talk about roofs all day long. I know you didn't come here this morning to hear about roofs, but... This building behind us is probably over 100 years old and is old enough that it did not have a plywood sheeting underneath the roof. It has one by sixes. And our roofers came in. They pulled off the old roof. They replaced any places the one by sixes had become rotten uh, due to leaks and, and, and replaced them. And you could, I looked at it, and you can see that the new boards are different color than the old boards. Then they put down uh, a sticky material called an uh, ice shield or moisture shield, and it's, maybe I've used it to fix roof leaks through the years. It's like a huge sticker. You roll off and you stick it to the foundation. It is waterproof itself. Then they put a layer of tar paper, and then they put the traditional roof on top of that. So we have a very high quality and secure roof that should last many years on our fellowship hall, and our um, office section of our building. So read the letter if you haven't read it. And if you haven't gotten the letter, which, by the way, I haven't. They were mailed Wednesday, and I still haven't gotten mine, and I live in Chickasaw. 
Uh, <laughs> but uh, please read the letter. Prayerfully ask the Lord how the Lord would have you to give. I was, um, as a matter of fact, when I was working on the letter, I, I felt so convicted about leading by example, I just stopped and went in there and wrote a check and put it on the desk, saying, this is my family's gift right here, right now, because uh, I'm a part of the team and I need to do my share. So let's uh, pray about that, and let's continue to be f faithful to God, giving our gifts to him, so the Lord may work in our lives and work in our community through the church. Let us pray to commit these gifts. Dear Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. So many times, so many places, you reach out to us, you bless us, and you help us. And Lord, we thank you for this time that we can return a section, a part of these gifts back to you, and just ask that you bless them, receive them, and multiply them for kingdom work in the giver and in the recipients. In Christ's name we pray, amen. When I survey
Thank you, musicians. That was uh, awesome. Thank you. If that doesn't help you get to a place to meet with God, we need to meet this week, okay? I want to ask uh, you two gentlemen, would you please come over here and sit, on, just like you are, but on this pew? And uh, uh, yeah, I fixed my microphone. Uh, my microphone clip was broken, but I was able to, uh, I found a, I did a little trick with a safety pin and I'm good. I want to talk to you guys this morning about forgiveness. I'm glad you're here because uh, forgiveness is, is really, oh, oh, come on, Molly, come on, can we get by me here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, forgiveness is, is, is such a good thing and we, we ask people, you know, as we, uh, maybe not yet in your life, but at some point in your life, something's going to go wrong and someone's going to make you really mad. And what's really worse, at some point, you're going to do that for someone else too. And you need to ask for forgiveness. And sometimes people will forgive you, and sometimes they say they will. I think about being forgiven is kind of like paper. You know, when you light paper on fire, it, they say it goes away, but does it really? Because uh, you ask sometimes people to forgive you, and, and even maybe they say they do, but later on they bring it back up, and they talk to you about it, and it makes you feel really, really bad, and it's... It's just, just really, really frustrating that, that you think you're forgiven, but you're not, and you wish you were, and it, it's kind of like this. Even though this paper's burning, there's still something here. <sighs> we'll let that burn itself out. Let me tell you another story of forgiveness while the paper burns. This is called a putter. It is a golf club used for putting. Uh, and if you ever go to a putt-putt course, this is the kind of golf club they give you and when I was uh, 12 years old, my church group went to a putt-putt course in my hometown, and we showed up, you know, 15, 20 of us at one time, and, and all golf courses you're led through in a foursome, groups of four. And so we were standing around for each group of four to go play, and we were waiting for our turn in line. And me and my buddies, we were in a group, and we were, we were clowning around. We were, we were sticking our clubs, and we were swinging them like this. We were swinging them like that and pretending we were at some kind of big golf tournament. By the way, you're not supposed to swing a putter like that. They're supposed to be used like this. But we were doing this, and we were cutting up, and my buddy Jonathan Smith, he swung back really hard, and his putter hit me right there. It hit me hard enough that, yes, I saw stars. And it hit me hard enough that I woke up laying on the ground with people looking over me going, Dave, Dave, are you okay? Well, I didn't think that much about it, and matter of fact, I didn't go home. I, we played golf that night. We played 18 holes of putt-putt golf. I didn't let that bother me. My, my face hurt a little bit a few days after that, but that was all. And honestly, I forgot about it. It wasn't really that big of a deal. Now it's burned out. We're going to talk about that in a minute. That's good. Um, I was 12 years old when that happened. When I was 28 years old, my friend Jonathan wrote me a letter thanking me for being a Christian. Thank you for being his friend. And in the letter, he said, do you remember that day when we, you were with a youth group and I knocked you out with a golf putter? He said, you never brought that up again in all the years we were friends. Well, uh, I didn't really think he did anything wrong, you know, because I was doing the same thing he was. Woo! You know, I was doing all the same stupid too. So it would have been, it's just as likely I did it that he did it. And I didn't hold it against him, but he always felt bad about it. And he appreciated that I didn't bring up his failure to be a good friend to me. Instead, we focused on what was good. And that's why God wants us to forgive each other is because it helps our relationships. And we don't want to have to carry around old problems. The really good news about it is there's scriptures in the Bible like 1 John 1, 9 that says if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you get forgiveness between people, sometimes it is like this paper. It's gone, but it's, but it, but it's kind of still there. When we ask God for forgiveness, it's very, very different. Well, can't do it left-handed. Because, see, when we ask God forgiveness, he takes it and it goes away. And that's the good news of Jesus. 
is that He forgives us and it's gone. It's not like that at all. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you forgive us. We thank you that you love us. We thank you for how you work in our lives. And we just ask that you bless us and you multiply our blessings into our lives. Lord, be with Jordan and these youngsters as they prepare to learn some more about your teaching on forgiveness. Give them grace and a good time today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, y'all may now go with Miss Jordan. By the way, middle schoolers, this is a true story. No, 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 this is a true story. That's an inside joke we got going now. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 18 as we move into our sermon series, An Extravagant Love of God, Forgiveness That Creates Forgiveness. And as you're taking your Bibles or your tablets or devices and going to Matthew 18, let me say one thing to you. I want you to know this because it's true. It's really, really true. It's always been true, but sometimes we forget it. And the thing I want you to know is that you are loved. Every one of us here and those joining online are loved. You're loved by God. Let's look at this together. Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 21. <clears throat> Jesus has been teaching. Parables have been given. He's been given wisdom to them. And as a result of the teaching, Simon Peter poses a question. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to settling a settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he, his wife, and his children should all be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him and said, Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt. But when the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, he grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and they went and told their master everything that had happened. When the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all of the debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servants as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. This topic, uh, I, I preach on it, I guess, probably about once a year because it has been an ex in my experience as a disciple of Jesus that this is a doorway into greater Christian living. This is one key area of my life that has really opened me up to greater work of God in my life, has allowed me to experience more of the grace of God. It's not, hasn't always been easy. And then the other reason I, I, I like to talk about in addition to uh, a benefit I've found in my life, I've seen other people benefit from it greatly. And then the third reason is there is a lot, I mean a lot, of misunderstanding in our culture today about what it means to forgive somebody uh, and how God relates to this. And because of that, I want to share five truths with you before we get to Matthew 18. And we have to get these five truths understood if we're going to be able to understand what Jesus was saying to his disciples and us today in Matthew 
chapter 18. And without understanding these five truths, unfortunately, many people come to understand forgiveness, giving forgiveness to God is sort of a trading game you do with God so you can be saved and you can be forgiven. And I tell you, from the bottom of my heart, God never intended his salvation for you or for me to be a trading game. The scriptures are clear. The scriptures repeat themselves. Salvation and forgiveness from God is a gift. You don't earn it. You can't own it, earn it. But God has given it to you. So the first thing I want to say as we prepare to go into understanding forgiveness is that people are amazing creations of God who are designed to do great good for others. When I was going to seminary, where you go to school to be a preacher, working on my Master of Divinity degree, I remember someone once asked me, how do you feel about being a pastor? And I said, I think it's going to be okay, but I am a bit nervous about doing funerals. Strangely now, I got to tell you, I kind of look forward to funerals. Not because they're sad. I don't enjoy the sadness. But I, I, I came to understand something. And I, I remember August 1993, Mrs. Roy Strickland's funeral, I did. And I realized the point of the pastor is to communicate that this person that has died is an amazing creation of God. And he or she has done great good for you. And that's why you're here today. And that has become, as weird as it sounds, a joy to me. Because I believe that about every one of us. That each one of us is greatly created by God. Now there is something I don't like about funerals. And not all funerals. But there are times that relating to funerals. I get to be in a room full of family members who hate each other. These people to my right hate these people to the left. And I can feel it. You could cut it with a knife. And I'm supposed to sit there and act like I don't notice. That is really awkward. Really awkward. Betty McLean, yesterday's funeral. It was sad. She's going to be missed by a lot of really good people. She loved a lot of people. But I enjoyed the experience because I was able to help people celebrate the grace of God in their life because an amazing creation named Betty McLean had come into their life and done great good for them. Let me ask you this serious, serious question, really three questions. Do you believe this statement about me? That I'm an amazing creation of God designed to do great good for others? Don't answer out loud. Now, what, second question, what about the person sitting to your left or to your right? Look left, look right. Do you believe that person? Is it an amazing creation of God designed to do great good for others? Some of y'all are talking about this. Huh? I don't mean to stir up, sir. But here's where it really gets hard. Friends, do you believe that you are an amazing creation of God who is designed by God to do great good for others? Well, I'm fixing to argue that all three of these are true as we look at the Bible here. Oops, jumps the screen. Let's look at here Psalm 8, verses 3 through 6. The psalmist says, When I consider your heavens the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set into place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and you put everything under their feet. Now, I know this statement about you being a great creation of God sounds like pop psychology. It just feels, sounds like some kind of feel-good rhetoric I'm throwing around to make us all feel good about ourselves. But friends, this is the Bible. This is what the Bible says. First of all, people are compared to the moon and the stars. 
The psalmist says here in verses 3 and 4, when I look up at the heavens and I see the beauty that God made, and I think about the stars and the moon, I ask this question, why should you care about me? When I look up and see all that God has made, why should I care about me? Now, the moon and the stars, remember, this was written before the days of modern astronomy, and so they didn't know the moon and stars were far away. They sort of thought they were kind of close together. They saw them as a group. Uh, I once read a a Russian legend that said, where does the moon go at the end of the month? God crumbles it up and throws it out in the sky and makes some more stars. I always thought that was a cool story, even though I know it's not true, it's still a cool story. But the stars and the moon stay amaze us when we look at it and we say, God, you made those. Why do you care about us? But the next verse, you do because you have made them, meaning people, a little lower than angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Angels, the heavenly messengers of God that were created by God before the creation of the earth. Uh, There were a very, very large number of them. If uh, you take Revelation chapter 9 you think that a third of them one day left in a rebellion with Lucifer. But there's a lot of them. And they're great and mighty and powerful. There's two times in the New Testament that one of the actual disciples of Jesus stands before an angel. And he, it's always a man, he is, always, he is so intimidated, two different people, two different times, they fall face down. And the angel says, stand up, I am a servant of God just like you. This happens twice. In the New Testament, I mean, these were people who walked with Jesus. They saw the works of Jesus. They saw the resurrected Christ. But when they saw an angel, whoa, that was a big deal. And we say, we are made just a little bit lower than the angels. That is really a huge compliment. That we are the second greatest creation of God ever made. The only thing God in his infinite wisdom and creativity ever made greater than us were angels. It's a mind-blowing thought. We could spend a long time on that. And then it says, you made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. We were given the world by God to rule over it, take care of it, and use it for our benefit. The other religions of the days when the book of Psalms was written, the gods ruled the earth and the people were the slaves of the gods. And here, it said that, no, God gave us the earth because he's so impressed with us that he wants us to rule over the earth. Second truth I want us to focus on is that my best self is uh, is me under the discipleship or the training of Jesus. Romans 8, 29 says, those that God foreknew, he also prayed destined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. We could talk about predestination. It'd be interesting. We don't really have the time today. But if you said yes to Jesus... However you understand predestination, then you were predestined. If you said yes, you're in, and that's good. And it's here, he says, not only are we predestined to be saved, we're predestined that we would be conformed. We are saved to be like Jesus. We are saved by God, so we will be more like Jesus over the passing of time. But for this to take place, There has to be an issue settled in every one of our lives, and that is the question of who is the boss of you? Are you the boss of you, or is Jesus your boss? That is the question. Everyone, every person in the world has to settle. And I think a lot of people who want to follow Christ and want to receive the blessings of Christ struggle way too much Because they never settle this question. Who calls the shots? Jesus or me? If you are able to say, Lord, you are the Lord. You are my boss. You are my king. 
God can work in you and this glorious process takes place, that over time you realize that you're being conformed into the likeness of Christ. And because I love you, I want to ask you this really hard question. I hope you'll think about it this week. Where do you see the conforming taking place in your life? And if you're not sure where it is, um, you can ask someone who's close to you. And you'll know, or you'll know something needs to change. Third truth is that unfortunately people do sin and we need forgiveness from God. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Do you remember back to the story of the fall of, God, of Adam and Eve? God tells them if you eat from the tree that you're not supposed to eat from, you will die. And they eat, and then they're still standing there. They were still alive, but they weren't. They were physically alive, but spiritually they had changed. They had lost the communion they had with God. And God says to us now, he wants to bring it back. He says it is the gift of God. A gift. You don't buy gifts for yourself. You receive gifts. You don't charge people for gifts when you give them a gift. If you charge someone for a gift, it's a, it's a purchase. It's a sale. It's a transaction. And those are fine. We do it all the time. But gifts are different. That's when someone just gives you their time or their possessions or their creativity or their love. God gives the gift to you of eternal life and forgiveness. All you have to do and all I have to do is receive it. The good news is that we are extravagantly loved. How great is the love of the Father that he has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God and that's what we are. You are extravagantly loved. Have you ever given yourself over to that thought? You are extravagantly loved by God. Or maybe just that you're loved by God. Maybe that's that we need to start with that. My mother was the uh, queen of trigonometry at Enterprise High School. If you don't know what trigonometry is, it is a complicated form of math. Uh, because all my other brothers and sisters took my mother, I set out to take my mother for trigonometry as well. Unfortunately, I am not, did not have the mathematical talent that my brothers and sisters had. Some of you have told me I'm good with math, which I really appreciate because I've always felt I wasn't because compared to Alicia, Buddy, and Sherry, psh, I was the, uh, the weak one in the group. And my mother, my mother was an amazing math teacher. So I, I just appreciate it. One of the things she did was she made a deal with you that if you made below a 70 on a test, you could take the test the next day for 90%. Now it would be a different test. Mom would go home and make out a whole nother set of trigonometry problems for you to take. You could take it the next day and you only got 90% credit. But if you made a 40 and you, uh, you know, you could see how that could get better, right? There was one catch. You had to be in the room at 7 a.m. Our school day started at 8. You had to be there at 7 a.m. And there were a number of times when I took my mother, I joined the breakfast club because I failed the test. And I went, and one day I, I failed the test, and I went home and I studied, and I gave it my best shot, and I went in at 7 o'clock, and I took the test. I met my mother that following morning. We had a break between periods 2 and 3, and I, I was kind of bossy. Uh, a little arrogant here. I said, Mom, grade my test. I should have at least said please. But anyway, Mom's a good sport. She does. She creates my test. She multiplies it between by time 90%. And guess what? I've made a lower score. Isn't that depressing? I was 17 years old, but I wanted to cry. I just wanted to cry because I had worked hard and done worse. 
And uh, not sure what to do with my emotions. I just left the room. I just walked out. Went out in the hall. And I asked myself, I said, Self, is there anything good you can say to yourself right now? Because I'm feeling pretty bad. And this word came to me. God loved you enough that he sent his son to die for you. And I have reminded myself of that sentence many, many times since then, that I am extravagantly loved and you are extravagantly loved as well. So if we receive extravagant love, we can do the miraculous work of forgiveness. Let's look at part of this passage here. The servant here in verses 28 through 35. First of all, this is a servant who owes his master, it says in the original text, 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents of gold was more than the tax revenue of the four provinces where Jesus was living. I don't know how much it is. I guess I should have looked it up. But let's say I said to you, hey, did you ever hear the story about the guy who was working at the McDonald's in Sarah Land? And he owed his boss, you know, he borrowed money against his paycheck. And he owed his boss more than the tax revenue of Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia. <laughs> Would you believe the story? Well, this is, Jesus is telling an absurd story to make a point. And the man says, this is crazy. I'll pay you back. This poor guy couldn't make that much money in 10 lifetimes. And instead, the master says, forget it. I'll cancel your debt. Jesus is making a well-played exaggeration. So the people will see the point of how far in debt we are to God. We are that far in debt. If you've ever seen the Grand Canyon, that is what our separation from God looks like. You can't get a running start and jump across it. But Jesus bridged the gap. And then because of that, God says to us, we need to forgive other people. And he tells the story of a man who, who owed maybe a week's salary to the servant, and he doesn't show this person any grace. And so the other, it's interesting, the servants notice the injustice to this and tell the master. The master doesn't notice it. The servants say, hey, we saw what you did for our friend, and then we saw what our friend did to our other friend. We got a problem with this. And the master does too. And then it says, this is how God relates to you if you don't forgive people from your heart. So what's wrong with this story? Why did servant one not forgive servant two? When he, and he, he didn't ask to have his debt canceled. He just asked for a little bit more time. There's a difference between having your debt canceled and just giving an extension. Servant one was still living like he was in debt to the master. And when we realize we've been forgiven by God, it changes the way we see ourselves. We see the world and the way we can operate in relationships. And the first point of the story is this, is that forgiven people are made to forgive. Have you ever heard the saying, hurt people hurt people? Sometimes someone will say or do something mean to you and it bothers you and you might tell someone else about it and they'll say, well, you need to remember hurt people hurt people. People who have been hurt tend to be people who go and hurt other people. And the opposite is also true. Forgiven people are those that go and forgive people. That's the point of the story. Not a scorekeeping plan God has for you here. God wants you to know that out of your abundance of forgiveness, you are to show forgiveness to others. And the second point of the story is that forgiveness is the way to healthy relationships. Because people are not perfect and people will let you down sooner or later. And because you belong to the group of people called people, you're going to let people down too and you're going to need to be forgiven. 
and receive grace from others, just as you will need to give grace to other people. Now, I don't know about you. If uh, I hope you've never had. I know from talking to people, it happens a lot. Maybe you've left, lived in a debt-collecting relationship. And when you mess up, it's bad. Now, there are sometimes because of that, we have to walk away from relationships. They're just too poisonous, and they're very crippling, and they, and they just ruin people. And that's a hard call to make as a follower of Christ, but there's a time. As I was thinking this morning about this message, I thought of a conversation I had with someone who I was trying to help, and for lack of a better word, I feel like I failed, and I couldn't help this person have hope and move forward because they were hanging on to the pain and the memory of the failures. There was nothing I could say, nothing I could do. I just said, uh, you know, I love you, and, and just kind of just gave up, you know. And I thought of another conversation I had with someone who had a disagreement with me, a disagreement with them, and we just had a great working relationship. Why? Because we knew how to give a little grace. It makes all the difference in the world. It's night and day in relationships between those who are debt collecting for their past. Because when you're trying to debt collect for your past, whatever someone has done wrong for you in the past comes to live in the relationship now. But then when we began to let go of that, we're able to love each other. Let me challenge you with a scripture. 313. 313. Um, I think if I was going to get a tattoo, which I'm not going to, I think I would get 313 right here on my left arm. Because this is such a great verse, 313. God says to us in Colossians 3.13, be gentle and ready to forgive. Never hold grudges. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. God calls us to forgive others because we have been forgiven. Who is it in your life that you need to forgive? Maybe nobody comes to mind at all, and that's great. I want to challenge you for your sake of your own sanctification, for your own life in Christ. Ask God this question. Is there one I need to forgive? Is there somebody I just can't help but keep talking about how they let me down? Uh, is there somebody in my life that if I think about him, I just get mad? Somebody else talks about him, I, I, I just get mad, you know? You've got to learn how to give grace because you need grace because you're not perfect and I'm not either. We give grace one to another. And just ask the Lord. I shared this uh, several months back that you ask the Lord to help you forgive that person. Forgiving others is divine work in you. And some of the, you just say, Lord, I, I really don't like this person. They, they were wrong. They were mean. They were cruel. They were vicious. They were. God help me to get them out of my mind. Let's lock that apartment in the brain and let's just leave it behind so I can be free to love the people God's given me to love right here and right now. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your call in our lives that we're called to serve you, to love you, to know you, because we're extravagantly loved. At every point of us being called to follow you, to live for you, to serve you, it all starts with you loving us first. In the chess game of our life, you always loved us first. Lord, bless us richly that we may receive your love so strongly, so wonderfully, so powerfully, we may be willing to forgive those that have hurt us, that have wronged us, that have mistreated us, that even have maybe even crippled us or set us back. Lord, help us to let go of those so that we can be free to live for you now, have the boldness and creativity to live for you now, and not carry around debts and pains from our past. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This is a difficult and sensitive topic I've talked to you about today. Thank you for listening so well. I really appreciate your attentiveness. And I just want to say... Uh, much as I'd love to pray with you right now, I'd love to talk to you. We could, this is something that takes 
sometimes some really serious work. Again, it's been some real serious work I've done in my own life. Uh, I want to encourage you to do it, and if you need to come and talk with me as your pastor, I would consider that an honor. At this time, I'm excited. I'm going to need a hymnal. We have someone who wants to join our church, and I want to invite Leo Lett to come up. <laughs> oh. They didn't clap when I joined the church. That's great. Leo, come on up here. Uh, Leo has been uh, working with a youth ministry. Many of you, on, I hate to tell you this, your mom is well known better than you. Uh, Ann Lett is his mother, who we've been praying for for well over a year. That She's been battling, with, battling cancer. Uh, Leo and I were talking to see Wednesday that she's doing much better. We praise the Lord for that. And we, we, we pray and we hope that she will be back with us in church. Uh, if your mom's not watching, you need to tell her to watch because she's going to be mighty proud of you here. Uh, and Leo shared with me about his commitment to Christ and his love for Christ. He was baptized and joined another congregation here in Chickasaw. And so now he simply comes to transfer his membership from that church to our church. And so, Leo, I ask you, as you become a member of our congregation, we faithfully participate in its ministries with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service. The answer in the affirmative is, I will. So, I will. Leo, we welcome you in the name of Christ, and let's just say a word of prayer for you. Dear Lord, we thank you for Leo Lett. We thank you for how he has been meant, brought into the world by you to be a gift to our world. And Lord, we just ask that you bless and multiply your blessings in his life. Help our church to be a blessing to him as he is a blessing to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to take our picture. All right. So uh, some of you want to shake hands, some of you don't. Leo, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't. Uh, would you hang around here for just a few minutes after service? People want to greet you and welcome you. His name is Leo Let. That name is in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, if you're a good Bible name that we don't use very much. Would you please stand for the benediction? May the extravagant, powerful, over all encompassing love of God overwhelm each one of us, and we may, may we live in that reality every day this week. Amen. <laughs>